Hello, it's Libby here. Welcome, as, as always, to everyone who's tuning in tonight on Zoom and on Facebook. My name is Libby Davies, and I'm very glad to be joined by my co-host, Robin Brown, for tonight's Off the Hill political panel. I'm joining from the unceded traditional territory and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Slavertooth, and Squamish Coast Salish peoples. Hi, Libby, and welcome everyone. I am joining you as always from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Thanks, Robin. Well, tonight on our panel, we're joined by Seth Klein, a new face to Off the Hill. Seth is the team lead and director of Strategy with the Climate Emergency Unit. He is also an adjunct professor with SFU's Urban Studies Program. In 2020, his book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate and Emergency was released. So a special welcome to you, Seth, this evening. We also welcome back Leah Gazan. Leah is the Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre and the NDP critic for children, families and social development, as well as the deputy critic for immigration, refugees and citizenship. Chuka Ekajem is also joining us today. Chuka is a columnist for rabble.ca and a policy researcher. His work focuses on inequity and inequality, drug policy, structural racism, and labor. Welcome back to you, Chuka. And a special welcome to Carl Nirenberg. Carl is an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, and filmmaker who works in both English and French. He is Rabble's senior, federal politics writer. So welcome to all of you tonight and welcome to all of you watching on Zoom. You of course can participate in the chat or ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And we'll do our best as we always do to address your questions as they come up. For those of you who are watching on Facebook, special welcome to you. So to begin, these past days and weeks, have been alarming moments in extremes, whether the climate emergency and the new intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC report, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and military aggression, or the circling rise of the alt-right from Ottawa and beyond. These are all issues our readers have told us are top of mind. So we're taking you to these extremes today and breaking down the common threads we need to be aware of. I know that our panelists are up for this rather daunting task, so let's get right into it. First off, uh, I'm going to go to Seth. Now, Seth, your book has mentioned A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency, a great read, by the way, I loved every page of it, clearly lays out the imperatives of how governments can effectively mobilize and act during times of war and emergency. And the book argues the need for similar responses for the climate emergency. It's very frustrating to see oil and gas advocates using the invasion of Ukraine by Russia for greater expansion and production of oil, even as the IPCC issued its latest report full of dire consequences, possibly the experts' most chilling report that they've ever produced. What parallels do you see between this war and the climate emergency, including the role, including uh, the role of the oil and gas sector and emergency responses? Mm. Uh, well, hi, Libby, and uh, uh, thanks everyone for this invitation. I, I'm also, like you, joining from the uh, unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I see so many parallels, um, uh, and these ironies, of course, uh, as you say, the IPCC report came out uh, a week last Monday, uh, and, and was pretty much pushed off the front pages by this war, ironically, this fossil fuel-funded war. Um, and, you know, to, first of all, to your first reference there about how the oil and gas industry is seizing on this moment in a manner that is uh, uh, both obscene and ridiculous, uh, you know, obscene to be trying to capitalize on this moment and, and bring back to life these zombie projects 
that we've already killed, whether it's uh, Keystone or, or uh, East, the East Coast LNG projects, uh, in really a very shameless way. And you see, you see CAP, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, doing this, and the Conservatives trying to amplify it. You also see the BC NDP uh, doing a little bit of that when it comes to LNG. Um, uh, I, I suppose, though, it's, it's worth um, holding on to the fact that it appears not to be working necessarily. Um, uh, the Biden administration doesn't seem to be biting on that. So far, it seems from the reaction of Stephen Gilbo and, and, and Jonathan Wilkinson that they don't really buy that line. And, and in particular, the European Union isn't buying that line. Um, we've seen some amazing news from them in the last two days that they're, they are drawing the opposite lesson, that the EU is talking about reducing its use of Russian gas by 65% this year, uh, in a single year, and, and this may in fact uh, galvanize uh, 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 a real advancing by many years of their efforts to get off of Russian gas. But, but the argument that the industry is making is also ridiculous because, of course, it takes years to get these kinds of fossil fuel projects in, in line. And this is the beauty of, re of renewables, is they lend themselves to speed and scale in a way that fossil fuels uh, don't. And so I think, you know, our task is to seize on this moment with a different narrative to say, uh, and, and you see Bill McKibben making this argument in the States, it would take years to get LNG or pipelines to Europe, uh, but we could get millions of electric heat pumps to Europe by next winter. Uh, and as soon as they're done equipping Europe, they, could, they can keep going and, and produce millions for us. Um, you, but the other parallels I see, I see on both sides, you know, on, on one hand, it's yet another reminder as if we needed any more, that oil and gas are poison. They're poison not just to our atmosphere and our land and our water, they're poison to our democracy, to politics, to peace. Um, but on the flip side, I can't help also seeing in the, in the reaction of Western governments to the invasion, in a similar way as the pandemic was, this reminder again of what kind of speed and scale is possible when governments see emergencies as emergencies. All of a sudden, the money is, is coming. We're acting with allies. We're banning imports. We're divesting uh, Russian holdings within days. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're seizing the assets of the oligarchs. All of these things that where we wring our hands and say, oh, these things aren't possible. They're not practical. Or it turns out we can do these things incredibly fast. Um, and, and now we need to bring that kind of orientation to the climate emergency. Thanks. Over to you, Robin. Yes, no, thank you for that, uh, Seth. Um, well, sticking um, with the war, Chuka, over, over to you. Um, despite the almost nonstop mainstream media coverage of the war in Ukraine, the coverage has presented a largely simplistic version of the story that is in reality far more complex. And we've seen how one-sided media coverage can fuel extremism, right? Fox News, for example. What explains this and, and how should progressives respond? Uh, thanks, Robin. Um, and I should say, I too am joining from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave through the First Nations. Um, I want to be clear that I'm not a historian, uh, neither a European historian or military historian, so I can't speak uh, in that capacity, but I I believe I can say, as all of us can say, being residents within this, this democracy, um, that I think that there's been a significant amount of pretty irresponsible reporting from major uh, media outlets throughout Western countries um, on what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, as you mentioned, I think it is largely devoid of context. Um, you know, we've seen like it is, you know, absolutely clear, of course, that this was an aggressive invasion on the part of the Russian government. But it strikes me that, and you know, I, I'll, I'll defer to the expertise on the panel, So, and, and Carl, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it strikes me that job one of being a journalist is to not take the government's word for it. And uh, every, and when, so when we see the United States government or the British government or the Canadian government say, this is an unprovoked, unjustified invasion, they're not 
describing reality, they're asserting a reality. They're fashioning a perspective through which they want their citizens to understand, and, and, uh, and by extension, the rest of the world, to understand history, right? They're setting up a frame by which they want people to understand the events that are occurring. And so for journalists to just report those statements as fact, I think is, is really detrimental to, to uh, developing a meaningful understanding among people among readers who are trying to determine how uh, how these horrific horrific explosions of violence keep happening and um, for example I think that we've seen uh, uh, recently CTV news um, published a story that included photos of women soldiers wearing uh, uh, wearing body armor that depicted the black sun the Nazi black sun that particular Nazi insignia has been showing up all over the place across media uh, in media across the western uh, across western countries and uh, seemingly there's a lack of familiarity with that symbol uh, which has no historical context other than its usage by the Nazis it was literally invented for that purpose um, and and so the one I think the fact that there isn't a recognition of that history is, is alarming but then also the fact that whenever there is public criticism of these stories or these depictions, the corrections that we see aren't meaningful corrections. They don't offer context. They don't, they don't identify what happened or why a particular image was removed, why a particular what a particular symbol is and why it's or why it's offensive. They just will say, oh, you know, there was there was we there was an offensive image and it's been removed now. And again, I think that that's incredibly irresponsible in the same way that uh, talking about what's happening in Ukraine right now is if there isn't this century of conflict or this this near century of jockeying for power between Washington DC and Moscow is similarly lacking context and lacking I think uh, uh, the, the the necessary information uh, that will allow people to engage with this beyond merely the states of the government which of course are going to reflect the government's interests and um, I think the the a couple you know a few more points that that I think uh, um, demonstrate this are one, for example, today, Facebook and Twitter both uh, both announced that they're making it permissible on their platforms to call for violence against Russians, against Russian forces, Russian politicians, and I don't know, potentially Russian individuals who are just just happen to be Russian. You know, the, the boundaries of it aren't exactly clear, but the idea that these that these platforms are make are, are announcing that it's OK to call for collective violence so the collective punishment is is i think all, can only be supported by a kind of reporting that portrays this as a very simplistic uh, 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 the very simplistic actions of a you know authoritarian madman or what have you um the the encouragement that we've seen from governments to to governments encouraging people governments and political figures and many figures encouraging people to go to the ukraine and fight just incredibly reckless the kinds of people who there there are people who are looking all over the world for military conflicts to go and learn from and the the idea that governments are announcing this is just i it's, it's it boggles the mind and uh very quickly the last point is um you know the the speed at which white majority countries western countries have have effectively declared open borders for ukrainians uh the canadian government declared a willingness to to accept an unlimited number of Ukrainians, it isn't just concerning given the, the sort of inherent racism that we can see in the response of Western countries and governments to this crisis versus others, but also in, in light of the IPCC report, knowing that the climate crisis is disproportionately suffered by the global South and disproportionately driven by the global North, there is an obligation to take to, to contend with the potentially tens or hundreds of millions of climate refugees. And that conversation is completely absent from what we're, we're seeing in media today. Sorry for going on that long. No, man. No, no, no thank you. That's a great answer. Um, uh, Leah, you have, um, just switching gears for a second, you, you, you've consistently advocated for a, a guaranteed livable basic income as laid out in your bill C-223 before Parliament. And you said that a guaranteed livable basic income is critical to address the rise of extremism in Canada. And you're calling for its consideration as part of the parliamentary review of the, of the Emergencies Act. And of course, the government is mandated to, to do that review after having invoked the Emergencies Act for the first time ever in, in response to the so-called Freedom Convoy occupation in Ottawa. What is the link between extremism and a guaranteed livable basic income? 
Well, first, I just want to say how nice it's to, it is to be home uh, right now, Treaty 1 territory, um, ter uh, homeland of the uh, Métis Nation and traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples. And, uh, you know, um, just meeting with community today uh, has just been so lovely. So the last time I was on, I was in Ottawa in the eye of the uh, illegal occupation. And, you know, I've always said, uh, even, even with my bill, uh, is very clear. I don't think a guaranteed income, a b guaranteed livable basic income is a silver bullet. Uh, I've been very clear that it needs to be in addition to current and future uh, government uh, programs and support. But we know through the pandemic, uh, certainly, that, you know, people are beginning to feel very deep despair. I think it's really real. I don't think we should underestimate it. I think mental health is at an all-time low. Uh, we've gone from a pandemic to now an illegal occupation to now the newest war uh, in the Ukraine. And, and spirits are low. And we know um, at times of despair, as we saw in times like, for example, the Second World War, people feed off that despair. They feed off that despair uh, and they feed off the vulnerabilities of others. So I'm not saying a guaranteed uh, income is the silver bullet, but I do think it is one way to protect people uh, from being vulnerable to participate in undemocratic, undemocratic and um, uh, extremist movements. Um, you know, a lot of people, if you if you noticed uh, at the convoy, I know uh, led certainly, as we know, by known hate leaders, but there were also a lot of people at the convoy saying, hey, you know, I owned a business, I no longer have a business, you know, I had a home, I've lost my home. And you know what happened in Ottawa, I've been really clear, it, uh, it was uh, an illegal occupation with a federal government that turned its blind eye led by hate leaders uh, from uh, across the country, fueled and funded by um, the, the ultra wealthy in the States. Uh, and they wrapped it in bouncy castles and hot tubs and the Canadian flag uh, and made it a place of joy, a place of belonging and a place of community. And, you know, I think that we need to be, first of all, really honest uh, have an honest discussion about where we find ourselves, uh, not just in Canada, uh, but around the world with the rise of extremism and alt-white and nationalist uh, movements fueled by the, by the ultra-wealthy. And as I said in a speech in the House of Commons, I don't think this convoy was in fact about uh, those who are pro-mandates and those who are anti-mandates. I think it's about the ultra-rich and the extremely wealthy and everyone else, including what uh, Seth uh, spoke about, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, climate justice. I mean, who are we protecting here? Like big oil, uh, big oil companies, uh, owners, uh, what's going on in the Ukraine? Uh, you know, we talk about the, the oligarchy in the Ukraine. Well, if we want to get rid of autocrats like Putin, then we have to, you know, shift our energy sources and immediately shift towards a guaranteed uh, or into to a green economy. And that includes things like putting in place a guaranteed livable basic income so that people actually have choice. So I really do believe I don't think that the, the, the pandemic or the um, sorry, illegal occupation was about that. I don't think it was about you know, people uh, figuring out where they wanted to stand on how we're going to move forward on the pandemic. I think we need to go after the ultra wealthy. I think we have to name it. I think we have to go after uh, fossil fuel com companies that have set up systems that serve very few and exploit uh, everything else, including Mother Earth. Um, and part of that uh, equation, certainly not the silver bullet, but a big part of it, I think, is a guaranteed livable basic income more than ever before. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lee. You, you guys are all doing a great job of connecting these issues. Uh, thank you for doing that. And now I'm going to bring Carl into the conversation and to, to I guess, bring us back to the Ottawa scene. 
as these issues relate to what's unfolding in the political scene in Ottawa. And uh, Carl, you're always a wealth of information, both historically and what's going on today. So if I can sort of put it to you, how are these extremes that we've been discussing of the climate emergency, of uh, possible war, of military conflict, and the alt-right beginning to play themselves out in the Ottawa scene? What is it that you've been taking note of there? Well, for one thing, uh, just to start with the, the Conservative Party, they have a leadership uh, race, and you can see that you could get a kind of um, partnership between a certain kind of extremist who plays the electoral politics game and another kind of extremist who uh, takes uh, his or her or their uh, battle to the streets. And we saw that uh, during the occupation of Ottawa when especially Pierre Polyev, one of the, the, the now leading candidate for leadership of the Conservative Party, went and allied himself with the occupation. And, and you've seen that going way back in history. Some people mocked me when I wrote about that. I said, you know, what happened in Ottawa was that uh, the the occupation took the whole center of the city, took it over, and essentially created a situation where the elected and legitimate administration no longer had control over bridges, transit, business opening, mask mandate, or even ordinary um, rule abiding, parking reg regulations, uh, idling regulations. None of it. They they, they had to cede sovereignty over part of the city and part of the city life to this group of people who had come and occupied, and you had legitimate political people uh, lending them support. Well, we saw that. We did see that uh, in Europe. Uh, we, we did see that uh, at other times in Latin America when the, um, when, when the government of Salvador Allende was overthrown in 1973 in Chile. That's what happened. The CIA funded truckers and cab drivers and other groups to protest and tie up life in the city and make things impossible. And then the parliament said, well, I mean, Allende didn't want to use, try to use police and military because he didn't think they were loyal to him. And then the parliament says, well, uh, the parliament who sympathized with these people and wanted to get rid of Allende says, well, he can't keep law and order as they were... As they were, this, they were playing a double bind game. As they were encouraging the very people who were destroying law and order, and we can see that happening in Parliament. That's one aspect. The other thing is that with Ukraine, I mean, one thing I have to say about Ukraine is that it has really uh, uh, cast, uh, created big, big divisions uh, in all parts of the political spectrum, including people who consider themselves to be on the left. And I'm sure I and Chuka probably don't agree. Uh, it, quite about Ukraine. I consider this to be a very dangerous, uh, illegal, un, unwarranted waging of war. And I think that before you wage war, you have to have a goddamn good reason. And I don't think Vladimir Putin has a good reason, whatever his grievances, uh, real and imagined. But it is creating these divisions as well. There are many people who took part in the convoy who are now trucking around with all kinds of, I, I use the word trucking advisedly, uh, going on social media with all kinds of conspiracy theories, uh, pro-Russian conspiracy theories um, about, uh, about the fact that the Ukrainian government is developing biological weapons or something. Uh, the, uh, the, da the nature of them, I'm not sure, but they're far-fetched, wild conspiracy theories or with some tiny little grain of truth. So you're finding an odd... Uh, weird, weird, uh, weird, uh, co weird coincidence uh, of events here. Look, I'll just go make one last comment. In the states, we talked about Fox News and things like that. In the states, you're seeing whiplash on the part of the right. You had in two or three days, you had Donald Trump saying about Putin as he was as he was flexing his muscles, he's a genius. And then you had Tucker Carlson, who's the leading broadcaster, the most popular news broadcaster, opinion broadcaster on Fox News and in the United States, uh, supporting the Russian invasion of in the first days. Suddenly, they turned around completely. Now they're running around and saying, oh, the reason the Russians invaded, even though we were cheerleading them, the reason they invaded is they realized that Biden is weak and they could get away with it. If Trump were around, he wouldn't dare invade. Trump was the very guy who was cheerleading him. So we're into very uncharted uh, and scary territory. But I mean, my main fear here, and I think people really should think about this, is we're talking about people all over the place openly 
openly speculating about and openly contemplating and openly talking about and proposing nuclear war. Putin is mm -hmm. the first one. But I, I just wrote an article about the former leader of the Liberal Party, who amazingly and irresponsibly went on the pages of the Globe and Mail and said, well, if things get too bad, things get too rough, if Putin pushes too far, we should use nuclear weapons against him. What does he think? He hasn't got his own nuclear weapons? How, do, how are we going to get away with that? I mean, I'm very, very, very old. And I you know, took part in ban the bomb demonstrations in 1960 before anybody else on this group was born. And I can tell you, this scares me. Enough for me. Yep. Yes. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Sorry, may I just quickly respond to the one uh, comment that he made? Yeah. About, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, Carl, I'm I'm not sure what it is that you uh, think that we disagree on because I don't I don't support an offensive offensive military action and aggressive invasion under no circumstances would I support that by anybody. But all I'm saying is that it's not credible for Western governments to claim that they are more interested in peace and liberty and justice for all than their own position in the global balance of power. And I think that that's inc it's incumbent upon reporters who are covering this to be honest about that. I mean, it's not, you know, if, if the, the United States passed a law, you know, to the degree that this law would be upheld, who knows, but the United States literally passed a law that compels the, the president to invade the Hague if any uh, U.S. service members or politicians are held there for trial. So, you know, how can we cite the International Criminal Court as a legitimate institution if it's one that our closest ally has has passed legislation stating it will never respect? That's my my point. Not that anything justifies an aggressive invasion. Not that there should be any lack or dearth of compassion for for people in Ukraine who are fleeing war or for anyone who is affected by this this crisis. That's not my position at all. But but, you know, for example, you're talking about nuclear weapons. I mean, like, there are more countries uh, on sort of this side of that of the, the geopolitical balance of power in that regard. There are more countries on this side of that balance that have nuclear weapons than there are on that side. And so, like, it's again, it's like these things are inherently contradictory. If we're saying if Canada's if how can we decry war and then have a domestic for profit uh, arms manufacturing industry like that's all i'm saying is that if our interest is in peace it has to be unconditional that's it can't be peace as long so long as we win yep i hear that yep um hey, thanks folks uh this last question before we get to audience questions is for um all panelists and i'll um we'll start with seth in terms of the answer and we'll go back but um as progressives, as activists, local and national, on and off the hill, uh, where should people focus their energy to carve a way forward for real security based on peace, climate, and economic justice? <laughs> Let's start with Steph. It's an impossible question. Um, there's so <laughs> much going on. Um, uh, and, and, and a lot of good, good points that have been made. Um, you know, for, I mean, first of all, there, there's so many things happening that we can pick up that, that we need to seize and try to redirect. Um, you know, Chuka was rightly pointing out this, this wild double standard in the response to refugees. Um, and yet I would also say that um, at the root of a lot of the response, uh, notwithstanding the double standard, is this 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 human instinct people have for compassion and, and solidarity. And now we have to redirect it. We have to kind of uh, recognize it and say, as Druka was saying, um, it's going to get worse, folks. Uh, the, in, in a climate changing world like we're heading into, uh, the global movement of people is going to be one of the defining issues of the next 50 years. And are we now ready to respond to that crisis with a similar level of, of compassion and understanding. Uh, to segue from that uh, and, and try to more directly answer your question, the, the I think what the IPCC report uh, clearly showed is that the climate crisis is the preeminent civilizational threat of our time. Um, although if nuclear weapons come up in this war, <laughs> that's a pretty, pretty close second. Uh, but what the what the IPCC report said is that in excess of 3.3 billion people are at high risk 
uh, and vulnerable to, to, to climate impacts. Um, uh, already, climate change is, uh, that's a sizable share of humanity, um, primarily in the global south, but we are not, uh, we are not exempt from it either, uh, as, as those of us in British Columbia know from last year. You know, we lost 600 people in a week last June in British Columbia, mostly lower income seniors uh, in the heat dome. Uh, we know that already with climate change, it is displacing up in the order of 20 million people a year, mainly internally displacing them and, and where the poorest countries uh, carry the, the greatest burden of handling that displacement. Um, uh, uh, so this is the real security threat. Um, and what both the war and the IPCC report are telling us is that we have to hasten the day when we are done with these toxic products, um, these fossil fuel products, and we need to quickly pivot and act uh, with urgency uh, on that threat. Um, uh, it's also the case, and, and this speaks to Leah's point, we both the pandemic and now this war are producing record profits, uh, uh, you know, to the retailers in the pandemic. And now the oil and gas companies are making just as many, you know, households are, are struggling with high gas prices. They're making a killing. Um, and uh, we need to we need to tax that and put it to work um, in expediting the just transition before us. Um, and, and, you know, what I take primarily from Leah's point, whatever the policy form is, whether it's guaranteed income or, 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 or guaranteed jobs, the, the point is um, the inequality that we experience and what, that was heightened in this pandemic is toxic to the social solidarity that's needed when you're asking people to undertake in a, in a, in a society-wide mobilization like we now have to do. And so we have to tackle these things together. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, Leah, just uh, re repeat it, just so folks uh, remember we're asking, um, yeah, where should people focus their energy to carve a way forward for real security based on peace, climate and economic justice? Well, I, you know, uh, similar to, to what uh, Seth mentioned, like I don't think uh, there's one focus. I think there's multiple things to focus on uh, right now. And I think there are certain common threads. Uh, certainly uh, growing inequality. Uh, what, when I was running uh, to for the nomination and then eventually the, the representative for Winnipeg Centre, I spoke about a growing corporate dictatorship. And I wasn't sugarcoating it. And some people said, oh, Leah, do you think that's harsh? Like, should you use terms like corporate dictatorship? And here we see uh, in the Ukraine the threat, just terrible uh, destruction, but also the threat of a nuclear war. You know, Carl, I, I share your, your concern uh, about that. I grew up with a father who was a peace activist who lost a job a teaching job because he refused to take off his peace button. I grew up in a family that was very actively engaged uh, in the peace movement. And the topic of the day, even in Russia, at the, at the verge of a potential nuclear war, what are they talking about? The petrostate, the reliance on fossil fuels. And in the midst of all of it, we see growing inequality. And so how do you address that? I think you dress it boots on the ground. I think you address it in government. I think you address it in academia. I think you address it door to door. I think, you know, this misinformation campaign, uh, this, you know, I know Trump coined the term pretty much fake news, but really fake news uh, to make sure that people are really getting proper information so that we have a clear direction to build a peaceful society that really um, uh, honors equality, because you can never have peace in the absence of justice, whether it's like climate justice, human rights, there will never be peace in the absence of justice. And that's ensuring people have their human rights met. That means the right to live with dignity, the right to live in a clean, healthy and safe uh, environment. 
free of violence with all their human rights uh, respected, including enough to live in dignity and a roof over their head. Then, then you can have a peaceful society, but there's so much injustice and, in the, in, and, and, and on overarching from what I feel is a growing corporate dictatorship that we need to go after the ultra wealthy. We need to tax them. Uh, and we need to change the way things are done, not just in Canada, but globally to protect people uh, above corporations, to protect our planet and our mother earth above uh, the privileges and rights that that corporations seem to be um, benefiting from. Hello. Um, uh, Chuka and Carl, we're going to give you both a chance to, to, to answer this one. So, but, but keep it brief because we want, we want to get to audience questions. But so Chuka first, um, yeah, where should people focus their energy to, to carve out a way forward for real security based on peace, climate, and economic justice? You're on mute there. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I similarly, I, I you know, I, I don't know that I can pursue. So I can suggest what people should focus their intention on. Um, but I think the thing that that is sort of continually circling in my mind is uh, that the only thing that matters is protecting and providing for everybody. Everything else is window dressing. And I mean, this is part, Carl, this, Carl, this is par, uh, part of why per, I especially appreciated uh, your intervention on discussion of the nuclear war, because the, 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 it seems that there isn't a recognition that that's just simply cannot be allowed. You know, the idea that it would be discussed at all is uh, uh, simply demonstrates so, sort of you know how far we've gone past a point any point of, of reasonable uh, uh, reasonable existence I guess coexistence and so um, you know I and uh, lastly I'll say that that I think um, Leah your description of the present events as a corporate dictatorship is perfectly uh, accurate exact um, you know it's it's if you take food from a supermarket without paying you're breaking the law if a supermarket throws away unsold food while people go hungry it isn't breaking the law the law clearly does not serve people thank you chicken Carl over to you so um, I'm gonna come down and say that that that, we, that my concern with the environmental movement and and it was a similar concern way 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 back many decades ago with the peace movement is that too many working class people and poor people uh see it as a middle class privileged entitled they see it as you know people who can eat their expensive more expensive organic stuff and who can afford to recycle and who and who can uh, afford the electric car or whatever and unless we really we're not going to you know, you know in the case we had a similar problem in the pandemic sorry to switch uh, here but where the where the where the war against the against the virus was fought mostly on the backs of the least privileged and the poorer people it was a failure and it was cre it created part of the backlash that we experienced in the occupation of ottawa and my fear is that we have to find a way much more than i think we entirely have to this date to really in a way i think we have to put social justice and creating a far greater equal a far more equal society first in order to make the war that we have to wage the peaceful war that we have to wage against climate change possible if we don't i don't think it's possible uh i don't think you can have uh, i think it'll just result in all kinds of dangerous backlash which is then picked up by the populist right which then becomes fuel and fodder for the populist right and by the way we didn't even talk about the fact that the war in ukraine is now putting enormous pressure on canada to vastly increase its military spending which is like normally speaking it's the most wasteful kind of spending from an economic point of view and that's i'm leaving it hanging in midair there because there's too many subjects no, no. too many strands thank you thank you all um, she, I, I just be um, uh, Robin. Before we go to um, to to the audience questions, I'm just wondering if Seth, I saw you kind of like leaning in, and so you wanted to respond to what Carl was saying about you know what comes first, what comes second. Yeah, any, any quick the response to that? It, I, yeah. I, I guess I balked at the at the first part. I, I think uh, you know the argument I've been trying to make is you marry the two. You, we've got to do them together, um, and that's when the magic happens. I mean, when you look at something like like, uh, and I I share the same critique as you, Carl, uh, of uh, of those the, you know those climate activists who say, oh, don't link this to tackling social injustice and inequality. You know, don't weigh weigh it down, make it more complicated. 
I think they're they're wrong. We 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 have to link these. Um, but when you do, it's incredibly popular. I mean, when you see this in the in the polling in in reply to something like the Green New Deal, when you when you present a definition of the Green New Deal and you link bold action tackling the climate crisis with bold action tackling inequality and offering uh, a, a genuine uh, and hopeful jobs plan. Uh, the combined uh, attractiveness of the two sends the popularity through the roof. Um, and that's what's been missing, right? I mean, the, we, we, the, the federal climate plans to date, there's, they've offered nothing on just transition yet and the connection with inequality. Thank you. Um, so now we'll take some audience questions. One's come in that says, basically says that they're loving everything you guys are saying and saying, why? Uh, are our federal leaders not reflecting this? What, what, or they don't, they don't see them reflecting this. What can we do to change that? Anybody want to take that one? I'll just say quickly that fe po federal politics, uh, electoral politics is a game of winning power or winning, a, winning seats in parliament. So uh, a lot of it, uh, if all federal leaders, including the leader of the NDP, they're always looking at where are the votes and what are their concerns a week from now, a month from now, six months from now, at the most two years from now. And it's very difficult uh, to lead a practical political campaign based on uh, the expectations for the planet and what we have to do for the planet for generations to come. So I think that is that is the, uh, the great uh, crisis for uh, federal leaders. You also have to break down whatever you're proposing into a series of tangible, bite-sized, uh, rhetorical uh, little packages. And again, I worry that too much of what's happening can be fodder for the uh, right and the extreme right these days as much as for progressives. And I think that is going to be a big challenge. But uh, I do think that some, you know, I mean, I would give um, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP some credit for making an, making an effort um, to link together these, these issues. And I think the you know, the various uh, provincial governments come and go on this uh, and provincial parties come and go on these on these issues. But, you know, when you're when you're running for office, you're very acutely aware of the voter who's got to get up in the morning and earn a living and wonder what you're going to do for them tomorrow. Can I respond to that? Yeah, sure. just yeah. because I'm in the eye of the storm, the colonial <laughs> storm here. Yeah. But uh, I, I would say I, I would say there's a, there's a truth to that, Carl. But I do think that there's a new kind of politic emerging. I don't actually get up every morning and have calculations about how to win the next election. I actually get up every morning on a set of values and uh, a set of principles that I promise to my constituents and fight for a better world. Uh, I've taken some pretty uh, bold stands uh, since being elected. I know that, uh, you know, the world's on fire right now, that uh, there is, you know, really in in intense growing inequality, uh, that there is wars brewing all around the world. And I, and I think I share that kind of conviction along with several other colleagues. So I think there's a disillusionment and distrust in politicians, and I think it's well-earned. And, uh, you know, I think we need to change that. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, we need to um, base our decisions based on boots on the ground. You know, I was elected, I've said it many times before, I was elected, funded, put in power by the movement. Uh, and uh, I don't think people should forget who keeps us in and who doesn't keep us in, and that's the movement. And uh, so I, I call out to the movement to keep our feet to the fire and, and uh, make sure we're doing the right things. I know that guides my uh, decisions. Can I just point out too, um, while it's true that there are lots of politicians out there who, uh, who default, default to a very uh, cautionary place, it is notable that those politicians, like Leah, uh, like Libby when she was in the game, who do speak boldly, uh, keep getting rewarded with some of the largest political margins in the country. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I, I was going to say, I, so I, I don't have the, the, um, uh, like the deep political experience of uh, the rest of you, but I do think that one thing that um, 
that sort of reinforces what you were talking about, Carl, is, and again, you know, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on this, but it seems that one thing that reinforces it is uh, the political reporting that, that largely occurs, you know, which, what questions do, do reporters ask and to whom do they ask them? If somebody proposes uh, a universal basic income, if somebody asserts that like no one will go hungry, they'll get asked by reporters, well, how are you going to pay for that? You know, but if people talk about you know, if, if, if I'm sure if someone uh, argued for a maximum wage or a maximum wealth, a hundred percent income tax past a certain level, it would be they would be sort of called a wild eyed communist, you know, and more power to them for being so. But still, they would be called that. Whereas if people argue, if people simply uh, uh, politicians aren't questioned why it's acceptable that there are billionaires and poverty, right? Like they, the, the fact that this is the circumstance of our existence, politicians aren't asked to justify it, but whenever they want to pursue radical action to, to pursue justice, then they are asked to, to justify that. And so I, I do think there's kind of a reinforcement mechanism that, that, uh, that quells uh, uh, earnest radical actors. Well, we don't want to put you in the eye of the storm as the reporter, but uh, any any uh, thoughts that you want to add to that? Well, you know, I just wrote a note. I said, you know, I've, I've always found that political reporting, uh, as has been done forever, is too much like sports reporting. It's appropriate to treat uh, hockey as a game. It is a game. It's also a business, but it is a game. In the final analysis, whoever you root for, your life won't change if your team loses. You know, my team, the Montreal Canadiens, have never done worse. Life will, you know, it's a momentary disappointment, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I wish I could tell my colleagues in, in the political reporting game, the people, when you, and the politicians often too, the participants in politics aren't merely the politicians, they're all of us. We're all participants. And, and, the, and the issues and the policies are as important as the ups and downs and personalities and who's going to win and who's, who's ahead in the polls and, and what this, what's going to happen. You listen to so much commentary and honestly, you could substitute a few words and you'd think they were talking about a hockey game and not about <laughs> uh, an election or about politics. It's so similar. And there's a lot, of, a lot of the people involved in professional political reporting are big sports fans, by the way. There's a big overlap. Some of them should have gone into sports reporting, I suppose, and really like that better. But uh, you know, it, treating treating it like a game and treating it like who's up, who's who's down, and whenever you, when you know when we get p reporting, it, we always turn it into this. We never we we rarely hear somebody report on a leader making a speech or proposing a policy, and and then discussing that in terms of its value or its impact or its worth. It's always well, what impact will that? have on this person's popularity will they win more seats that way uh, what do polls tell us how are they likely to make that work um in the political game it, 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 we become i mean it's it is a frightening the degree and it's often so wrong-headed because you have people sort of blathering about it, don't really know what they're talking about anyway i don't <laughs> want to be ragging on my colleagues in the political <laughs> reporting game but yes it is not um it is not a great art and there's very few people very deeply involved who, are, who have a very great um, preoccupation with uh, policy. Uh, people really are interested in the who's up, who's down, and the personalities and the scandals, uh, and, and they think that's what's going to get them, uh, get them you know, more clicks or more eyes or more ratings or whatever. Well, that's why, that's why we're glad that you're here, Carl, because you do ask tough questions and your, your uh, columns reflect that too. I'm just going to switch back to Leah because we did get a question, Leah, um, asking about the guaranteed livable basic, basic income in your bill uh, 223 and basically saying, are there members of the bloc, uh, well, first of all, the, the NDP and the Greens have been very supportive of your bill, I believe, but are there, are there members from other parties, uh, particularly the bloc and the liberals who are allies on some of these measures for a more equitable distribution of wealth? Um, absolutely. There are uh, members certainly of the Liberal Party that have been very uh, supportive, certainly <clears throat> former uh, conservative Senator Hugh Seagull has been a longtime uh, advocate of, of guaranteed uh, livable basic income. And Senator Kim Pate, of course, has put forward the same bill on the Senate side, exactly mm -hmm. the same wording, same bill, uh, Bill S-233. Uh, and I think for different reasons, you know, um, 
for me, uh, one of the reasons I've been pushing for a guaranteed livable basic income is because I think poverty is a vile and violent human rights violation. It's one of the most violent. Uh, the fact that I represent the third poorest riding in the country, the fact that every single year, including this year, people die literally frozen, uh, freezing to death outside. Uh, we lost two people, in fact, uh, this past uh, this past little while from the cold. That's violence. That's violence because we watch that. We watch people freezing to death. I think that's violent. <laughs> Um, you know, for other people, they, they support it because we know every dollar you provide is a dollar you put back in the economy. So, you know, people, people support it uh, for different reasons, certainly. Um, but I do think it's gaining in, in popularity, uh, certainly in Alberta, 60% of even Albertans, a very conservative party, support a guaranteed uh, livable basic income. And that's actually true throughout the country. And I think um, as uh, people find themselves feeling less secure, uh, certainly in places like Alberta that hasn't really done a good job diversifying their economy, there's more sort of uh, support for things like a guaranteed uh, livable um, basic income. In addition to current and future government programs and support, I want to be very clear this is not a UBI. This is, we have guaranteed incomes in the programs. GIS is a guaranteed income program, not uh, livable. EI or social assistance, guaranteed income, not livable. This is actually, I'm not offering something new. This is not something that we don't already do in Canada. What I'm saying is that we need to make guaranteed incomes livable and we need to expand them out for those that are falling through the cracks. Uh, you know, arguments about, you know, we need to, to fight for a living wage. Absolutely. But there's all sorts of people that fall outside of neoliberal systems of work and understanding of what is classified as work and not work, unpaid care work, artists. Uh, and so, yeah, there's support uh, across party lines, but we need to be careful about when we talk about uh, uh, income guarantees, what they're actually supporting. Uh, um, I'm supporting a guaranteed livable basic income that is very specific, inclusive, and builds on our social safety net, does not replace it. Thanks, Leah. Um, we're getting near the end, but we've got one more. I think we can get in one more uh, audience question, uh, although not everybody will be able to answer it. But this goes to uh, Leah just mentioned, and it's been come up. It's come up obviously that um, with things like the guaranteed income, people ask, "Hey, how are you going to pay for that? How are you going to pay for that?" So we got a question from the audience saying, um, "Some people are talking about a windfall tax, especially with regards to oil and gas and the Ukrainian war. Can anyone speak to to that?" Seth? I'll take that one. It's right. one of my favorite topics. Um, and uh, so as people may know, uh, my, my, my book is all structured around lessons from the Second World War. And, and often with questions, mm -hmm. I've become like people's weird uncle and talk about back in the war or whatever. Well, let me tell you what we had in the war. Um, uh, back in the First World War, in fact, rampant profiteering, really grotesque profiteering, had undermined morale and recruitment efforts. Uh, the Mackenzie King government was acutely aware of this as World War II began. Um, and uh, that's why we saw the introduction of unemployment insurance and the family allowance came in in the war. But on the flip side, they capped profits with the excess profits tax. And the way they went about doing that is, is they went to, they went for every sector and industry, they went to the four years before the war um, still depression years, 1936 to 39, they averaged it out. And then they said to every business in the land during the war, large and small, this is your annual limit. Uh, once you hit that limit, uh, as Chuka was alluding to before, your top marginal rate becomes 100%. Um, that's what we had in the war. So the kind of profiteering that we've seen in this pandemic was illegal in the Second World War. Um, and you know, the, the question is around windfalls. What do we mean by windfalls? We mean profits in excess of the norm. And it's not, it's not a policy puzzle how to determine that. We know how to determine that. Thank you very much. Um, did anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Or was that a pretty um, complete answer? 
Just to, just to quickly talk about windfalls. I mean, one yeah. group one group of companies that made a huge windfall in the pandemic were pharmaceutical companies. You had a situation where uh, pharmaceutical companies developed vaccines very quickly with a high proportion of the investment being public money. In fact, I mean, huge amounts of public money were poured in and then they developed this vaccine. And not only have they made huge windfall profits from the vaccine, which everybody, we're very happy to have, uh, most of us, but they're refusing to allow uh, a, a relaxation or a lifting of the patent protection rules so that we can extend the benefits of, of the vaccine to the global south and to poorer countries. So this is a quite, uh, this is a truly obscene um, situation that that's evolved. Uh, and if you're talking about that kind of uh, windfall, I mean, another area where people are making huge windfall profits at a micro scale, but hundreds of thousands of times over and over and over again is in housing and the way housing uh, is 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 organized in Canada and the way housing is the way the, way the capitalist economy uh, markets housing and, cre- and creates a bought and sold commodity of housing and not a right. So those are areas aside from looking at the windfall profits of the oil and gas industry, I think we have to look more broadly at uh, at windfall profits and the nature of uh, corporate power. I mean, you know, finally, I'd say we have to look a lot more in Canada about the notion of having publicly owned productive enterprises. I mean, we, re- we maintain one company and a few others, but a company that I worked for many years called the CBC. I mean, it actually does fairly well considering all the problems and all the funding issues that it has. But I mean, we've maintained that as a publicly owned uh, corporation as we sold off so many others. Uh, notoriously, the Connaught Labs, that was a, a company that produced uh, a vaccines about which Linda McQuaig has written. But I think that, w- w- I mean, th- the notion that hey, Colin, the government can't do it, now. the people can't do it collectively, only private business can do it, is is quite ludicrous, in fact. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to carry no, on. No, it's good. no, no, you never carry on too much. It's just that we run out of time. That's what happens. Um, so first of all, thank you to uh, the audience members who made really great interventions. And I really want to thank our panelists. You guys did an absolutely super job of taking on uh, actually fairly difficult questions. Um, and I think uh, creating the space for us all to get into the notion of what's possible and what's actually doable. You know, it's so easy to feel shut down in times like these. And so I think each of you tonight have really been very concrete and opening up that kind of important space about what we can do, understand what's going on, about what we can do to redirect our energy and our, our focus. So I thank each of you uh, for that, to, uh, to Shuka, to Leah, Seth and Carl and my co-host Robin. Uh, It's been a very good discussion tonight and I just want to let everybody know that the next panel will take place on Thursday, uh, April the 14th. Leah will be joining us for that panel as well as lifelong anti-poverty activist and executive director of Food Share Toronto, Paul Taylor, who has been on a number of these panels before and will have other guests as well. So be sure to sign up folks for Rebel's newsletter, which is at rebel.ca slash alerts to make sure you get the invitation for the next um, panel discussion. And finally, a thank you to Rebel uh, for creating a space to host these important discussions. As always, we encourage you to help out Rebel as well by becoming a monthly donor at rebel.ca slash donate. So thank you all for joining us tonight, panelists, audience, Rebel. We look forward to seeing you April 14th. Don't forget to mark it on your calendars. Have a good evening, everybody.